Okay, so I suggest we get started. Um, I think most of us are here who we're going to be. So it's great to have Simone here visiting for a few days. Uh, he got his PhD from the uh, University of Milan, working on Atlas, looking for graviton decays uh, via diphotons. So we have a photon, not a photon expert in our course. So now he's at the University of Santa Cruz. Mostly focusing on R and D for uh, so-called LGAD detectors, which are fast silicon detectors that are uh, hopefully going to be put into Atlas as part of the upgrades. Our big discussions are part of the time of flight in the EIC. I guess in the near detector yeah. or experiment that I assume to tell us about. All right. <clears throat> okay. So as Elena already introduced me, uh, I'm currently a uh, a postdoc in the speed group at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and that was since September 2017. So basically, I'm at the end of my contract. And uh, I did uh, a lot of studies uh, on LGAD radiation hardness for the HDD sub detector in the Atlas experiment. Uh, now I'm leading the design of the silicon speed target for the Pioneer experiment and doing some AC LGAD RD for the electron ion collider. And on top of that, I try to do some blue star sky silicon research. And, and as Alan said before, I was a PhD student in the Atlas detector. So first, a uh, brief introduction of what is 4D tracking like. The concept is actually pretty simple. So when you have a tracker, so a tracker is several layers of usually silicon detector that has multiple hits. Uh, but sometimes you find yourself into this condition where you have your detector plane and a lot of it. And so if you use standard uh, track reconstruction algorithm, it, it's getting pretty hard to understand what is what. So the track overlap and uh, you don't really know which it corresponds to which track. <clears throat> so it, it kind of gets to, uh, if the pilot is too high, you get into a condition where you cannot do this anymore. But if you add an extra variable in your detector, which is time, then from the situation on the upper left, you go to the situation on the lower right, where each single point uh, on top of the position has also assigned a time. And then you can detect whether a particle comes from the same vertex or two particle come from a vertex that is like one millimeter apart and with a picosecond uh, time resolution, you can tell which come first and which come later, or you can definitely tell if particle come from other interaction, if, uh, if it comes from out of time pileups or from previous collision, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm sorry, that's a yeah. simple comment. Timing to what? The purpose. Timing of the heat of the, uh, yes. of the heat, yeah. Yeah, but that's a too good. By uh, yeah. 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 And then, uh, I mean, in the final 40 tracker, the, the final goal was to assign times to vertices. So let's say that you have two very nice tracks that you can reconstruct well, and they have a very specific timing, and you know that they come from the same vertex, then you start to assign. Uh, that kind of time zero to all the trucks coming from that vertex. So it's, I mean, it, it's still a lot of development is needed to achieve full uh, for the tracking. And uh, yeah, with this, uh, with this idea, you can have efficient tracking in dense environments. So you can do the ground event suppression. You can detect love link particle, for example, if you see a truck appearing at some point that it's outside of your collision time or you can see if a particle appear or disappears uh, that's what we call appearing with empirical tracklets or you can also do kind of like particle identification at uh, low energy but which solid state technology has sufficient time resolution to achieve this so there are silicon photomultipliers they are kind of fast but I mean, a bit tricky to use because they have very little radiation hardness and low granularity. Then you have HV CMOS, and uh, these devices actually work pretty well. 
Uh, they have other issues in terms of depletion, efficiency, etc. But uh, there have been papers on silicon germaniums, silicon germanium HVC MOS, and they can reach a time resolution of between 50 and 100 picoseconds. Then another thing is 3D silicon sensor. Uh, this will be the, the third image there where you have this kind of column or sometimes micro trenches where the, the input, the PN junction is not at the top of the sensor, but it's in between these columns. And uh, this has a very short drift time, but you still have substantial uh, collected charge because the particle traverses quite a, a lot of material. And with these devices, even if you have no gain, you can still reach 20 to 30 picosecond of time resolution. But then they also have other issues. One of the, uh, of the issues is that you have, you are tying basically the brief time with your granularity and sometimes you don't want that. It might be problematic. And then there are what I do most, which are low gain average detectors that they have an intrinsic gain they are very keen and they can get to 20, 30 picosecond of time resolution. So to dive into that, this is how an FDOM looks like. So you have a bulk, this part here, which is a standard silicon sensor, low redo, uh, usually 10 to the 13 uh, particles of doping. Uh, and then extra, you add this average region, this P region here that Instead, it's go to 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 sometimes. So you are an order of magnitude away, away in doping. And what this creates is a high electric field right, right here next to the, uh, to the readout. So what happens is that the particle deposits energy here, then the charge tree, it drifts up here that where it gets multiplied, and then you have gain in your output signal. So one important thing about this detector is that they're not avalanche detector. Normally, like a CPM, you have a gain of like 10,000, and that's because you're multiplying both electron and holes. With LGAS, you are tuning the multiplication just enough so that you are multiplying the electrons, but not holes. So you have this slide and this uh, very slow increasing gain as you ramp up the biophotons. So you can really select, okay, I want a gain of 10, I go, I want that to gain a 20, etc. <clears throat> so uh, these, these devices, as I just said, have gain that usually cannot go higher than 50. And as gain, I just define it as the charge collected by a melt over the charge collected by a same size P. <clears throat> uh, an important parameter is that these devices are thin, so they are usually 50 microns or less. So they have a fast rising edge and a fast pool collection time. They can reach a time resolution less than 30 picoseconds. And even though this, this technology is pretty new, they were um, built for the first time by CNM like seven years ago. Now there are several producers of Algas. Uh, there's CNM in Spain, HPK in Japan, FPK in Italy, you know, just behind this close by here. And then there are like some Chinese uh, producer that are really ramping up the production at the moment. So I've worked with uh, this kind of device and uh, r and since I moved to UCSC in the past few years. Can I ask you about this yeah. um, If you multiply like one, yeah. but no holes, how do you get charge? That, I mean, that when you multiply the electron, you create an electron and hole. Okay. It's just that if uh, uh, the hole itself is not multiplied. Oh, oh, oh okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it is just a one way average. Yeah, 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 thank you. So here you can see how a pulse from an LED. So normally for a silicon detector, we have this blue and red line from the left and the holes. Uh, but with an algorithm, you have this contribution from gain holes coming from the electron. And you see, for example, that the peak of the gain hole is when you connect, collect the last electron. And then you have a little bit of gain electron, but it's really a small contribution. 
And uh, the, the fact that this is so fast is because you can have a thin detector. Like if you have a 50 micron detector of normal silicon, you don't have enough collected charge to do anything. Like right? then it usually gets completely buried by the noise. But thanks to the gain, then you can do it because uh, you have uh, with 50 microns, usually you have alpha pentacoulomb of collected charge for an MIT. But then if you have a gain of 10, it becomes 5 pentacoulomb, then most trackers works with this kind of uh, uh, collected charges. So the time resolution of an ELGA has multiple terms. You have the time walk, uh, which basically is because sometimes a particle deposits less charge or more charge. And this you can easily correct away if you correct the timestamp, the time of arrival of the pulse with some quantity that can be uh, CFD um, algorithm, so you you get always the fifty percent point as your timestamp, or you can correct it with the time of attraction. So how why the pulse is? So this can be minimized. Then you have the Landau noise, and this noise it's intrinsic to how thick the detector is. So again, this is another um, <clears throat> this is another point in favor of thin detectors. Basically, this uh, is because the electron sometimes it deposits more energy at the beginning or more energy at the end. So it's not homogeneous to deposit the charge. So you have to correct basically that your limit is how homogeneous the, the charge is deposited into the sensor. And the thinner the sensor is, the better it is because you have less variance in the way the charge is collected. And this is a fixed term. Every time you see an algorithm, you will see that the time resolution will plateau to a certain value, and the value is always the same given a certain thickness. And then we have the last component here, the jitter, that is basically the noise from the electronic component. And this depends on the rise time divided by signal to noise. So the rise time, again, the thinner the detector is, the better it is. So it's going to be uh, faster in the rise time if the sensor is thin. And then signal to noise ratio, this you can actually minimize. I mean, you can minimize this component by increasing the signal, so by increasing the gain. So usually, uh, the time resolution from an algorithm starts that is quite high when the sensor is low gain. As you ramp up the voltage, the gain goes up. You minimize this component and you eat what we call the, the Landau plateau. So you kind of reach a, um, a fixed level of time resolution. Thank you. Sorry, but the uh, time parameters also to the quantum of capacity. Yeah, that's, so that's for the kind of side detector. It's, it's also crucial. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. it's already out, it's out yeah, 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 it depends. Uh, because the, the thinner the sensor is, the more capacitance you have, sure. right? Exactly. So it's kind of a fine, it's a balance, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you make the detector thinner and then you have less rise time, less Landau component, uh, but then usually you have higher noise on because the input capacitance is larger. Uh, but I mean, you make a thin mic 10 micron detector, it's probably too thin, and you don't really get an advantage. Uh, for a 50 micron detector, it's kind of balanced. You can still have uh, a decent input capacitance, but then uh, this will increase the noise, but then you, you increase the signal. So that signal to noise level, you can always try and increase the gain. And second question, uh, gain also maybe can be a function of temperature or not? Yeah, 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 because that's um, that's uh, related uh, to to the speed of the electron and noise, right? right? Mm -hmm. So we had this issue actually. If you make a, a sensor with too much gain, what happens is that it will go into breakdown just after full depletion, mm -hmm. and that's an issue because uh, the the way the the velocity is separated for electron and poles. For electron, it kind of saturates almost immediately, so you don't have the issue. But for holes, mm -hmm. the saturation comes later, so you kind of need a substantial electric field in the bulk, in the in the central region. Otherwise, everything is lower. Mm -hmm. So you, if you if you don't fine tune that, you end up with a sensor that breaks down almost immediately and has a terrible pen resolution. 
because the, the velocity is not saturated. And yeah, so all these properties allows for an improved time resolution. And we actually have some of the sensors that uh, have time resolution as low as 70 picoseconds. And uh, the other bonus is that the full charge collection time is fast, which usually is not a plus for normal uh, uh, colliders because you don't really care to see one pulse after the other. But for other applications like being monitoring or for Pioneer, as you will see later, this is also important. <clears throat> so now I, one of the issue of standard LDAP is that um, you have your gain layer, but here at the edge of the gain layer, you usually have a bunch of field ones and they all get to one point. So they create some kind of obstacle here if you just leave it like this, or if you just leave a square uh, gain layer. Uh, so a sensor like this, it will just break down almost immediately after full depletion because you will get uh, extremely high electric field just in one point. So what you have to do is something like this, uh, where at the edge of the gain layer, you kind of create this ball of uh, M plus doping. Uh, to kind of spread out the field lines as you get to this point. However, this this kind of structure takes take place uh, takes space. So, in between the gain region of this pad and the gain region of this pad, you have this bad region that can be between 50 and 100 microns, sometimes higher, uh, depending on the design. And this is, of course, okay in the case of the Atlas or CMS detector where you have a, a granularity of the millimeter, then you have like 10% of that region. But if you really want to achieve 4D tracking where you have a heat every 100 uh, micron, 50 micron, et cetera, this is obviously not good. And you will have more than half of your detector that is completely inactive. So in the past few years, there has been a lot of R&D uh, to overcome this limitation, and uh, oh, can I ask them? Um, yeah, a question. So you say that is already 50 to 100 microns, but is it really? Is that an up to scale or not? Uh, really in this, have a good sense, you know? I mean, this your schematic. Well, this is. I think it's in scale for the for the A Lumi LXC detector. So this is one millimeter in total. The whole thing. Oh, no, no, this, I mean, this can be as big as you want. I mean, that one millimeter is uh, one uh, pixel. So this is one millimeter apart, and then you have another, and then, I mean, in our case, we have like 15 by 15 arrays. Uh, oh, so the final sensor is like this big, yeah. but uh, then it's granulated to uh, with 1.3 millimeter pads. Yeah. The issue is so in between the you basically copy paste your structure you have yeah, yeah. in in this okay, so. yeah. yeah yeah but then if a particle hits here you don't see it yeah. or you see it but without gain so you don't see it basically. so one way to go around it is that you don't split in between pads anymore you don't split the gain layer so you have a continuous gain layer. And then you have a continuous N plus, so a continuous uh, I don't know, but it's like, um, N connection. But what's the issue here? So what you would like to do here is uh, then you have your oxide. So these are AC couple, and then your metal on top, and you see the mirror charge. But this design, if you use a normal other design, doesn't work because if the M plus is conductive, it will just shield the charge from the top metal. So you need to use um, resistive N plus connection. So this is lowly dope. Usually the M plus is dope to, I think, 10 to the 18. This one is like a thousand times less because you want resistance. You want, and usually we want shift resistances between 100 ohms to a kilo ohm to kind of see this effect. But then if you have this design, <clears throat> what happens is that you don't have any more the issue of field factor because you don't have any separation. You can do a 10 by 10 centimeter sensor and it will be fully active. 
right? You don't have this issue anymore that some parts of the sensor do not work. And on top of that, there is also a mechanism called charge sharing, which I show here. Yeah. So uh, when a particle hits here, part of the charge will be seen on this pad and part on this other pad, right? So you are able to pinpoint where the heat is with a higher degree of precision of your pad granularity. So it was proven here that if you if you add, for example, a 300 micron uh, pads, so you have a pad every 300 micron, and usually they're not as big as the beach, you have smaller pads. Then your resolution can get down to tens of micron. And this is particularly important because one of the big issues is that the, the channel density of uh, timing chips, if it gets too high, then you have too much high, too much power dissipation. And so you cannot pull it down. Well, if you do a design like this, where you can use information from multiple pads to reconstruct your event, then uh, you're off the hook, right? You can have a pitch of 500 microns and then you can reliably cool down, but still with a precision of tens of microns. Mm -hmm. So one downside of this is that if you have multiple heats in the near, in the same near region, then it doesn't work anymore. So this is a good solution for a low density tracking environment. Uh, so this is still in a ready phase, I'm going to show some data later, but there are already applications, as you already all know, uh, they are proposed for some parts of the electron ion collider, the vector one, and the fortified new experiment. So you kind of suggest that the timing that you would get could help. Oh yeah, yeah, that's also because when you are in this situation, you don't have one point of measurement of the constant, you have two and possibly four. And uh, that doesn't help in terms of the land term of the time resolution, but it does help in the jitter term because the, um, you have, I mean, every single channel has a different noise, right? So that you can average out. So this actually helps. Uh, the issue is that you have still a charge split. So you're not, I mean, it, it gets better if you combine sensor in the, in the middle, uh, but if you are under one pad, usually you get a better time resolution because the signal is twice as high. So you have a factor square root of two in between the time resolution that you can achieve at here and here. So just um, so you can actually get timing from separate pads because they're separate devices. Yeah, you, you get the one time stamp for one and one time stamp for the other, and assuming that they are synchronized, you average them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that should be some time to information. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a it's a weighted average. Okay. Yeah, otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, this will screw everything up. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you average uh, with, uh, with that. Well, is it then true that if you increase the gain, then actually it, it completely worsens the, the minimum distance you can still involve two tracks? Or no? Ah, you mean that if you have too that's much gain? What, that's what I, I yeah. really kind of said it when I was thinking about it. Because yeah. if you have signal everywhere, you have only one track here, and a second track here. You have signal everywhere, right? Yeah. You need to play yeah. The, uh... So this is actually one of the main issues that we are studying right now. So it's not a lot about the gain. It's more about what if you have a high energy deposition event. Yeah. Right. So that's that is really what we are thinking about for Pioneer. So from simulation, in principle, the signal of the second neighbor should go down to less than 0.01% and then it just goes down and disappears. What we see in actual sensors is that as you go to the second neighbor, it kind of plateaus to the level of 1%. Uh, and uh, we are really trying to understand if this is something that is in the sensor design, 
but uh, it can also come from other factors like crosstalk on the board or crosstalk between the wire bonds in the under antennas. So, so this is, I mean, this is something to really understand. For, for application like the EAC, though, where most of the particles that you detect are minimum ionizing, it's likely okay. You don't have this issue. Like when you go far away here, this, is, this will be under the noise, likely. EAC occupancy is negligible somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or another one. Yeah. And of course, what kind of occupancy we are speaking about? This is 200 micron difference between. Uh, how many events you can see the two particles coming close to 200 micron, make it close to zero. So, so what you can see also, yeah, it's a, 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 a factor, but not maybe uh, say kilopascal. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it might happen in one layer, but then in the next layer, there will already be a part, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, something like this for high lumia LHC will probably not to be good uh, for, for the hand cap because it, it will light up as you said. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one nice thing that you can do with ACL that is that you can pattern the top in the, I mean, in the way that you want, you can invent this new kind of geometries. And uh, it's not even hard uh, because you don't really have to have any, any underlying structure. So it's just the top mask of your uh, wafer handling that has these patterns. And so you can make small pads with a lot of space in between. You can make micro strips. You can make these kind of edge like patterns or these kind of cages. And uh, for example, this will allow you to pick up more signal, but without increasing too much the capacitor. So that's that's why also we have these micro strips that are hollow to reduce the input capacitance that you're on the tire. And uh, for example, here I, I show these two patterns. So in one, you know, yeah. 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 It's understandable, yes, but really signal sharing between different parts of tape takes place because it's resistive layer. Yes, this is also a very crucial parameter for this effect. It also can be tuned, it should be reasonably uniform, and so on. And it's a lot of lot of the activities of the resistive layer is crucial, crucial detail for this detection. I'm going to try and do it here to the end. So it will be more stable. Okay, I'm saying I'm a struggler. It means, first of all, working inside of magnetic field. It's also crucial, for example. Yeah, Zoom crash. Okay, can you see the slides again? Sorry. Yeah, so it's good. Yeah, so I, I wanted to show the difference between this kind of pattern and this kind of pattern. So these are color maps taken with a laser. So you just raster around the sensor with a laser. 
Uh, that's why you have this shadow. So if you are with laser on top of the metal, you don't see anything, but you see the response around it. And you see that the response from this kind of pad is kind of is octopus, right? So if you are in here, if it happens here, you probably have the same resolution in one direction and in the other. But then you pick up less signal because the capacitance through the oxide is less. So sometimes you might want a, a design like this one, where you have this micro strip, and in this case, we also added some arms here at the edge. And then you see that the response is kind of all in one direction. So the gradient of the response. So these kind of paths, they give you a better resolution in this direction and a worse one in this direction. But then overall, they have more uh, charge pickup. So you have a better signal to know it. So you can kind of fine tune your top design in any way you want to any application that you want. But then, as I said, this technology of ACL, that's the, it has this limitation that if you are in a high density environment, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so these are other solutions. Uh, one is French insulated alga. So instead of having those JP termination of the gain layer, you just chop off, chop off uh, a piece of silicon. You create a trench and you fill it with insulator and this terminates quite well the gain layer without generating breakdown. So with this kind of device, you can actually reduce the gain layer, the no gain region in between paths to five to 10 microns. So you can just go down by a factor 10, which or this already allows for finer segmentation than a 100 micron pixel is possible. I am sorry, but yeah. maybe that's probably for you. How many technology should be used to organize like time saving and fuel dumping? Sorry? What kind of technology should be used for such procedure? For creating this? Well, yeah. it's, it's not so unknown. Uh, they do the same thing actually for ITDs. Okay. So, if, yeah, you, you have to dig down with trenches a little bit more, I think. Uh, they need to be like five microns deep. Uh, this is. Of course, so not precise. Maybe chemistry yeah. or maybe mechanical stuff. How they do? Uh, I think this is. Uh, I don't know. Like yeah. they, they don't share it. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know. I also could not find. Yeah. It in such very very peculiar stuff and yeah. how they're doing. It. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I became never told. Me. <laughs> Uh, so these are still the prototypes. Uh, they actually have some issues of high leakage current, so it's not perfect yet. But these first uh, devices that we got, so they seem to be working well. So this is a strip sensor with trenches, and you see that uh, this is one trench. You have a flat response under the the strip, and then it goes down, and the other goes up. And this is the uh, the scale of one of the microns, so it's pretty precise. And then another solution that we actually thought of and patented at Santa Cruz is the DJ Alga. So since uh, you cannot, um, I mean, if you have a continuous gain layer with PNM at the top, you have to segment it, otherwise it doesn't work. What if you take this gain layer and you bury it under the electrode? So you have your P region, your gain layer, then another N plus layer that runs down the field, and then you have another N region. Then you can segmentate the top in the same way you segmentate standard silicon sensors. So you can achieve whatever granularity you want. And uh, so this might work. We actually run some ticket simulation, we saw it working. And now we're working with uh, I mean, with a company to actually produce. Uh, we are trying to produce first prototype with SPIR fund. We already have first prototypes made at PNL, but uh, we we didn't fine tune the the PNL enough, and so they don't work. They just break down immediately. But uh, we are, we already have some non-working prototypes for that. So yeah, this is regarding the general algal uh, uh, technology. Then I'm gonna dive in a little bit into the electron ion collider. 
So um, disclaimer, I'm not that involved in the electron collider, so don't ask me to specific questions, but uh, I'm gonna try and give an overview. So uh, <clears throat> we used to have this main detector proposal. Uh, now it seems like the uh, Etcher proposal as the upper end after the, the committee, um, uh, the committee uh, meeting. Uh, but for all of these detectors, so both for the central detector and also for the far forward backward, uh, there is application for timing. So we plan to use time of flight uh, for particle identification and tracking, and also for the, the Roman box detector as a two end. The the time scale for this is very tight, so I don't know how well we'll do it, but uh, we'll see. Uh, so, in general, 4D tracking is of great interest for all these collaborations, and uh, uh, LGAD is a great technology to achieve 4D tracking with also with a, a low uh, material because you can have this thin sensor. In principle, you can thin away of the support wafer, so you only have 50 microns of uh, silicon plus your readout in the way. And at the moment, they see how that is the most advanced hydrolytic technology. So it might be the right one, even also because the, the environment at, uh, at the electron ion collider is uh, uh, at low density. So I worked at UCSC mostly on sensor development uh, for, for AC algae that were, were actually invented at UCSC in 2017 before I even came here. Uh, but I, I joined the effort for the electron electrolyzer five plates, so I'm still ramping up my involvement. But I've been doing general ACL, and I also have uh, the Lano laboratory to set up a, an LGAT uh, testing uh, facility. So now I'm contributing to the ACL the general development to a grant that we applied uh, with the UCSC, AK in Japan, and DNL. Uh, that is a US Japan grant. Um, it is with ACL development, both at DNL and uh, HPK. And what they do is they have ACL prototypes. So we do simulation of ACL prototypes with, uh, of ACL with uh, ticket software and also do some uh, test beam analysis for the uh, terminal testing. So, one thing that you can do is particle identification with time of flight. And uh, you only have to go to low momentum, for example, for electron and pions. You can only have down to uh, alpha GeV if you have a precision of 30 picosecond on alpha meter or 70 picosecond on one meter. Of course, if you want to separate the uh, protons to electrons, this can be stretched up to 6 GeV. Uh, but uh, the, the way to make Everything better here is to go down in time resolution, maybe 20 picosecond, maybe 10 picosecond. So, in terms of requirement, uh, this is from the latest action meeting. We want something like 25 picosecond per week, uh, a precision of 30 micron in, uh, in the direction uh, of the barrel, uh, material, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in terms of time resolution, 25 picosecond is very achievable on the sensor side, but it might be a bigger electronic for it, a uh, bigger challenge for electronics. However, one thing that we have at the AC um, is that we don't have a very high radiation environment. So one, one big issue for high linear LHC is that all gets died down. I'm gonna show you later with radiation damage, so you have less signal to noise, but in this case, you're not worried about that. So you likely have high signal to noise throughout the entire data taking. And then in terms of heat precision, 30 microns can be easily achievable for a 500 micron chip using the ACL gun. And if you have three millimeters in the other direction, you can probably have, have something like 100 micron of precision uh, in the other direction. And this is thanks to using the ACL that uh, at charge sharing. So to, to have this both, you have to develop not only a chip that does TOT correction or some kind of correction for the timing, but also some kind of pulse height measurement uh, to evaluate the, 
uh, the charge picked up by every single pass to do the charge sharing. So that this will be a, an extra point that is going to be developed on the electronics. So here I introduced the issue of why don't we just use another technology like the French insulate, Belgrade, et cetera, and we just have a high pixelation instead of messing with this charge sharing mechanism for RTL yet. So the problem is here that for each channel for a timing sheet, you need to add two TDCs, you have to add this kind of TOT logic to correct the pulse. And so, and also fast amplification, you have to have a certain bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. So this increases the power dissipation by a lot per channel. So I'm giving here a number that we had for HDD. So uh, CO2 cooling, we could, uh, we had the limit of five milliwatts per channel that for 1.3 millimeter pitch is something like 500 milliwatts per square centimeter before we get into thermal runaway. So it just continues to, the temperature just continues to go up, but it's not, uh, it's not possible to operate it. And we cannot really go much better in terms of cooling, right? That's kind of the limit uh, that we are facing with at the moment. So if we have a reasonable power consumption goal of alpha milliwatt per channel, that is already 10 times uh, less than what we have at high lumia LHC. The minimum pitch that we can leave is, is 500 microns. You can see this curve here. So if you have uh, uh, 500, uh, um, this is 400 uh, uh, microwatt per channel, then the limit uh, before you hit this, this level that it's actually half of what uh, we want at high lumia LHC. You, you can have a maximum pitch of 500 microns. So if you want a better precision than that, you need to use charge sharing. Or another way is to create a perfect chip that does not consume power, but this is of course um, not true. I mean, we cannot really make something like that. So here are some results. So these are some prototype strip sensor for the electron ion collider. Uh, here you can see the effect of the strip line. So you just double the strip line and you start to see a different kind of response. Uh, we still have to fully understand why this happens. We believe it was a local effect. It seems, it seems like it, it's more like a global effect. So this still has to be studied. Uh, and then this is the effect of the strip geometry. So you have a different pitch a uh, different strip size, and this is how the detector response changes. So if you have finer strips close together, you have the red curve that goes to zero faster, is that if you distantiate them, uh, the curve goes to zero um, later. So this has to be fine-tuned to what you want, so how well you want to detect to nearby hits. Uh, that is the real question versus um, what is the maximum pitch that you can uh, afford in this case. And these are some uh, TIGA simulation of the devices. So in here, we have some testing data that is the purple curve and all the other colors are simulation of the strip response. So this will be with the strip center here and these are the neighbors. So it will kind of follow this curve here. And uh, it shows you how the behavior change if you, fine-tune the resistivity of the impulse input. So the, the more uh, resistive it is, the, lab, the more insulation you have. Yeah, and then there's just a, a very brief outlook of the electron ion collider. I'm going to now switch to Pioneer, which is the experiment I'm mostly involved with. So Pioneer is the successor of these three experiment here. So Pioneer, Fan, Pi, Beta. And the goal is to improve the precision of this parameter here, the ratio of pi and decay to electron and muon to an order of magnitude. Uh, and this is because this, this parameter is uh, a precise measurement of black hole kernel universality. And then the additional goal is to measure the branching fraction of the pi and beta decay. And also in this case, we want to go down by an order of magnitude. And this is actually the cleanest measurement that we can pick up of BUD, so it's a very important test to, the, 
to check the CKM method unitarity. So Pioneer will take place at PSI. We send uh, the proposal to PSI in January 2022, and we were approved with high priority. So the plan is to start data taking there before 2030. So the first collaboration wide effort that we're going to have is a testing at PSI for the beam characterization in a couple of weeks from now. My involvement in this experiment actually started pretty late. I, I was involved in a conference in 2020. I gave a talk on body tracking technology and then we started talking and I got involved more and more in the collaboration now and kind of leading the design of one of the two detectors. So in terms of physics for this kind of recap of what I, I just told and briefly stated, so we want to measure this value error in you. Uh, and it's quite important to go down by an order of magnitude of precision because we know this number from theory, from the calculation down to 10 to the minus four, but the current results that we have, they're down to 10 to the minus three. So there is an order of magnitude still between what we measure and what we uh, calculate. So you cannot really compare these two values. However, with Pioneer, we can get to the same level of precision, and then we can have a direct comparison and see if these two numbers are actually in agreement or not. And uh, this, this process uh, is elicitly suppressed, so the pion detained electron is, uh, is very suppressed, and uh, it's very sensitive to pseudo scalar and scalar couplings that are not in the standard model. So, to give you an example here, uh, these uh, charge bits, basically this, this kind of process can be sensible if we have a direct comparison at, with a charge X up to the scale of 1000 of PDB, that's, that's a lot. Uh, so a disagreement here will be a clear indication that there is something behind the standard model. And then the other, um, <clears throat> the other measurement that we plan to do is to uh, make uh, the, the ion decay beta, uh, the ion beta decay branch infraction very precisely again go down by an order of magnitude because the current precision is like 0 0.6 and we want to go to 0.05%. And this is again very important for the CKM matrix uh, unitarity. So, in terms of experimental design, uh, the, the idea, at least for the first step, is to separate really well these two processes. So, pion decaying electron and pion decaying muon and then electron. So, the idea is to have a main detector here in the center, which is what we call cater, an active target, uh, that can separate these two processes. We can already tag them live by using high granularity and high timing. So this is kind of a schematic update. There is a, a several layers of silicon detector with high granularity. And then you can see really the pion decay uh, goes in, stops, and then decays one electron. So you have just two tracks. Or if it stops or just decay in flight, then you have a kink and it goes to a muon, and then you have another kink and then it decays to a positron. So you can kind of separate all these kind of processes. And also, if, if it's a muon, so if the pion decays up here and then the muon goes in and then decays to an electron, you can uh, tag that decay by looking at the energy signature. And then the exit positron, then in one case, it's a two body decay, so it's fixed at 70 and even in the other, it's a four body decay, so it's kind of a, a shoulder from zero to 23 MV. So if you measure these two spectra very precisely, you end up with something like this. So you have this shoulder of the muon decay and this peak of the, of the electron decay. So if you look at this without a logarithmic scale, you're going to say, yeah, OK, they're perfectly separated. It's super easy, right? But then you have this kind of event, this experimental broadening of the peak. And if you really want to go down to the 10 to the minus four precision, you really need to take into account also this small fraction of band that overlaps with your other spectrum. So you need both the anchor to kind of tag the decays and a very high 
resolution uh, calorimeter that is going to be either liquid xenon or LSO crystal. They both have pros and cons, and we are still uh, seeing which will be the right technology. At the moment, we are leaning toward the liquid xenon, but it's still uncertain. So in terms of ATER, what they do is basically it's going to be a series of strip detector uh, with 90 degree angle between one and the other. And uh, these are going to be either AC alga or trench insulated alga. It's very dense, so you want to have 50 of these layers as close as possible to see the decay. But then you have services, you have the wire bonds, you have the flex sticks. So we'll try and do the best that we can there. Uh, in terms of single layers, we want to have full active layers. So a 50 micron detector won't do because it will just curl up. You need some kind of support. So we are thinking of 120 micron detector. Also, in terms of channel density, you cannot have too many layers too close together. Uh, so the, the design is kind of a compromise between the granularity that you all want, the total active area, the timing, and the dark material. So this is kind of a CAD drawing of the detector. So you see all these flexes going down. Uh, one thing that we are trying to do is that the readout chip is not going to be here because if the time chip is here, it's going to be in the way of the exiting positron and you want to degrade that energy as less as possible. So what we are trying to do is have a flex that ships then an amplified signal back here that here it gets amplified and this is outside of the calorimeter acceptance and then it goes for the digitization back here. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very complex design, and one big issue will be the how to cool this device, uh, and we cannot really afford active cooling, so it's going to be passive cooling, and we're going to see how well we can do it. So the, the idea is to fully digitize uh, all the, the region of interest in the, in the meter, and afterward do some kind of fancy analysis to separate every single heat also in time because sometimes you have the pion going in and the muon going out like going backwards so it will overlap with the pion heats and at that point uh, the only way to separate the, the two heats is by time so you see the pulse going up peaking then it goes down and then it goes up again so you can do all these kind of fancy reconstructions there I'm sorry, yeah. I just made one proof of moment that to get the needed precision, you, you have to have huge statistics. Yeah. And that is why you need very fast detectors yeah. to work with high rate experiments. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. So, what is the rate on target? Uh, it's very close to me, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. It's written somewhere. Number of soft so pines inside of you know, one megahertz. Inside of active yeah. stages, it's very close to one megahertz. Yeah. So I was a little confused because at the very beginning, uh, you have a, a, the first pioneer slide. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. So you have the active target. So what are all these things? That, are they other detectors in that? Here? Oh, this is the calorimeter. So this will be a representation of the SIP and readout. It's a scintillation calorimeter, so you, you look at the light. Okay. It's and usually, each is circle, it's photosensor. Oh, it's in the middle of scintillation. Okay, but so what do you, what do you detect there? In the car, in the gas. You look at the scintillation, and you look at the electric the signal. You look at electrons or what? Yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the positron goes out, right? And you want to measure the energy of this exiting positron as well as you can. So you can have these two separate spectra. Okay, so that's actually from the calorimeter. Yeah, yeah, this is from the calorimeter. And what I was pointing out is this. So this cannot be resolved by the calorimeter. You need data to take okay, into account no, this overlapping data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you have an event here and say, okay, does it belong to this spectrum or this spectrum, then you look at here and say, okay, I only see a single key. 
from a pion to a lepton, yeah. and then you can tag this as uh, direct decay to a lepton instead of intermediate. Uh, I mean, this is what really what limited the pion precision is overlapping the length because they only had the color meter, they didn't have an active value. Uh, Uh, yeah, then in terms of challenges here, as I said, you want to recognize these bits that are sometimes one and a second apart with their very different deposited energy as well as a good spatial granularity. So this is can be done with thin alga. So this um, train here, it's a train of X-rays uh, taking a test lab as a serial facility. And you can see that you can easily separate uh, one pulse to the next with a two nanosecond separation. So one nanosecond is pushing it a little bit, but you can still do it. Um, then uh, you can have a very high precision, even though your pitch is not the greatest with ACL, that so you can get to a less than 10 micron precision for a pitch of 200 micron, that is the baseline design. Uh, we tested some prototype and they seem to be working well, at least with normal particles. They still have to be tested uh, with high ionizing events. Uh, we tested some trench insulated algae and they also seem to be good as an alternative technology. Uh, another thing is the energy response. We want to have um, a good energy reading and that's mostly because as i said sometimes the pion decays before the target and then you have a new one that decays to an electron and in that case you can kind of tell something by how the energy is deposited differently between the pion and the new one it's kind of like a tofp idea the, the idea right so you need a decent energy response. And we saw that you can have an energy resolution of around 10%. Uh, this number is really up in the air. The, the only direct measurement that I did on this was with X-rays. So it's, uh, it's not even particles, uh, like charged particles. So I don't really trust it, but we are trying as much as we can to kind of get a, a good evaluation of that 10%. But I tried also with beta particles. We are trying with alpha particles. We're going to see how it turns out. And then there is another big issue here, which is the gain suppression mechanism. Uh, basically, what happens in Dualgar is that if the charge density in the gain layer gets too high, so if you have a high energy deposition, then you start to lose gain. And Again, this is a thing that has to be studied and fully understood. I don't know what's happening here. Do you still see the slide show? Yeah, when it goes the same as the obvious. Yeah, maybe it works. Okay. So, and then another issue is that we want low material around the ether. So, uh, this is because you want to reduce the input on the exiting polyton energy. So that's why we are in this flexi shipping out the signal instead of having the chip right away. Uh, so we did a prototype flex. We tested it in, uh, in this manner. So you have your sensor and your prototype flex and then your amplifier. And we kind of saw that it can be done. Uh, I mean, more studies are needed, but it seems like it's possible. And another big issue is the mechanics. So we, we need to understand how compact this thing can be. Like, of course, you can now glue sensors together and expect them to work. Uh, and another issue is the amplifier and digitizer. They need kind of a kind of need to have a wide dynamic range. So you are able to see both the MIPS, the electrons, and the positron and the neurons that you have the positron of more energy. So one thing that we are uh, trying to see if it's possible is to ship both signal, one amplifier and one not. Uh, but then you need a specific chip to do that. So we are trying to work uh, with other groups and also with companies to try and 
produce something that uh, will be good for pioneer. There is an SPIR call coming up for nuclear physics in October, and we are going to try and apply for that. Um, yeah, so this was regarding Pioneer, just a brief look. Uh, in terms of Pionomi, LHC, I'm gonna, I, I left it for last, but you all know that both the Atlas detector and the CMF detector, they want timing layers. And uh, the big issue here is not really the gain or the time resolution, but it's more the radiation damage. So most of the work that I did on this uh, was to, um, fabricate a radiation hard design for LGAT because LGAT they are great, they have good collected charge, good gain, good time resolution. But as you can see from this plot, this is collected charge as a function of bias voltage at different influences. This is the new sensor. And after like three to the 15 of neutron damage, you go down here. So from a collected charge of like 50 femtocoulomb, you go down to a collected charge of two femtocoulomb. So they really degrade uh, with radiation damage. And the time resolution goes up as well. Here you have like 25 picosecond, and after three to the 15 of radiation damage, you go down to 50 picosecond. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, don't yeah. interrupt you. Return back to pioneer experiment. Yeah. Why nobody asking? Why pine plus but not pine minus? Well, it's easier. <laughs> yeah. Everybody realized it. Why pine plus? Pine plus. Huh? What, what is the reason? It's thinking about it. You know what's about what, what, what is your reaction? Okay, <laughs> you can explain, please. <laughs> Yeah, it's easier to have a proton beam. Yeah. So you have a proton beam, a target, and pi plus comma. If you have an anti-proton beam, then you might be able to do no, it, but yeah, not, it's not, not only, easy. Not only, because yeah. even if pi minus, you also do get a lot of electrons. Yeah. It's secondary. And this is very difficult to solve. It's particular that thing. That is why select the positive channel. You go in, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I actually so are these are these uh, is it possible to uh, do some kind of curing by increasing the temperature of them? I mean, this is this is over a ten year period, right? This fifteen, I think it's fifteen. Yeah, uh, yeah. You mean annealing? Yes. You anneal them. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really change that much because it's not standard silicon damage. It's actually I'm gonna. I don't know if I'm going to pull it here. Uh, so it, it's not normal charge dropping, et cetera. It's, it's different. So this is what uh, we call the acceptor removal mechanism, okay. where you have uh, your silicon structure with your boron atom, and then radiation damage comes in and creates this interstitial that are usually oxygen. And this oxygen bonds with the boron and removes it from the silicon lattice. Right. So even if you eat it up, it doesn't cure like normally silicon does. Mm -hmm. So then, then really we actually did studies of, okay, let's take the irrigated sensor and annihilate it there for like 100 minutes, 200 minutes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it kind of changed a little bit at the beginning, but then it kind of plateaus. So it never really recovers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about yeah. Yeah. More, more uh, so what? But what you can do to reduce this effect is uh, you can shape your gain layer. So we saw that if you have a very thin gain layer, but you dope it a lot more, it kind of stays there longer because of just boron density. Another big uh, groundbreaking discovery is that if you add carbon to it then this effect is much less. And that's because the carbon catches these oxygen atoms around. And so the boron stays in place and the carbon is just implanted and it's electrically inactive. So it doesn't make any change before the radiation, but after the radiation, you can see the effect here. So these are two sensors that were identical before the radiation and after 2.5 10 times the thinner radiation, the carbon ones still have, like, 
almost 10 femtocoulombs of collected charge, and the one without carbon doesn't have any gain left. And then another way is to have this gain layer a little bit deeper. So instead of having a one centimeter, one micron deep uh, gain layer, you put it at like 2.5 microns. And this tends to the capacitor effect as you ramp up the high voltage, you will multiply elect, uh, the electrons for more, uh, I mean, for a longer uh, stretch of space. And so, this is the effect here. So these again are two sensors that are almost identical, uh, but uh, this sensor has a deeper gain layer, and you see that a three different influences how this helps, especially here in the intermediate fluences. So when you get to this fluence, it starts to be more or less the same because the boron is completely deactivated. But here you can see that you can have more gain and at a lower voltage. So if we combine these two, these three technology, actually, we actually can get uh, a sensor that is good up to a few times the 15. So with, with this combination of technologies, we actually made the most for high energy. And uh, yeah, UCSA did most of these studies, some of these plots. Also, if you open the HGPD TDR, I mean, I wrote most of that. So now we go to other applications that are not tied to anything. So we are starting to study very thin sensor 20 micron prototypes. Uh, this is a very old prototype from Amamatsu. We are trying to produce something like that with BNL and uh, FTK also produce some of these thin detectors. And we can kind of see that the Landau limit uh, for a 20 micron sensor is around 15 picoseconds. So you can really go down. So maybe with a 10 micron sensor, you can get to 10 picoseconds. So you can really push down uh, the time resolution if you go really thin. Of course, at the expense of other issues like huge input capacitance if you are amplified. But these thin detectors, even 50 micron detector, they might be useful also for standard tracking because they have gain. So you, you can have them thin and the normal tracking chip will work with them. But uh, uh, the advantage is that even if you really damage this detector, so if you apply 10 to the 17 and if you equivalent neutron sweep, you can still get to full depletion. One big issue that you have with thick silicon, like a 200 micron strip silicon, um, is that as you go to this level of radiation, then you need like 2000 volts to deplete it, to just deplete the entire silicon. Instead, if you have a thin sensor, you can get the full depletion at less than a thousand volts. Uh, so this this might be a good way to have like a um, a tracking a vertex thin layer really close to the beam line, a very hot collision uh, environment because this this sensor can be fully depleted even to a uh, enormous amount of radiation damage. We tested some. Uh, one to the 18 and they can fill the fleet. And then other application in X-ray detection, uh, we did some studies at the Stanford the Synchrotron Light Source, SSRL, uh, with uh, X-rays of energy range six to the 16 with several thickness of detector. And we can get decent time resolution uh, per energy resolution. And we can also, I'm showing again this, pulse train. So you can actually use this sensor to really uh, detect one pulse from the next, even in a gigahertz environment. And uh, on top of this, you have the advantage of having a silicon detector to detect a low energy X-ray, which is usually not possible because in it, if you have a very thick detector, the X-ray is going to just deposit its energy. Like it's not as a minimum ionizing that traverse the entire detector. So usually you cannot detect like 5 kV uh, X-rays with silicon, but without that you can. So that is yet another application. And we are actually trying to build a device with gain that is able to see uh, sub kV X-rays. And then the challenge is that if you put even the tiniest sheet of metal on top, it doesn't work. It just gets absorbed in the metal. So. We are trying to see if there is some kind of material that um, 
allows you to have like an open window in your vector. So this is a nice side application that we are trying to study with all that. And then uh, uh, I can speak through this part if you want. Yeah, maybe they could Yeah, okay. Well, I was going to ask actually. Yeah. Have electronics. Maybe there's a big overview. Mm -hmm. So what's involved in reading this out? Is it standard? Is it developed or what? So we have something. I mean, the, the time chip for Atlas and CMS, they are quite decent. Uh, they consume a lot of power, so that needs to be addressed. Um, but I mean, it's standard CMOS technology. It's not, it doesn't really need like tens of gigahertz of bandwidth. Like with a gigahertz, you can easily achieve all the time that you want. And that's, Partly thanks to Algot, because if you remember that the pulse of the Algot at the beginning, they are not like normal silicon where the rise time is infinite. Like you, you don't have a steep rise edge. Thanks to gain, you have this kind of slowly rising gap. So you don't want to, you don't want a lot of bandwidth to read them out. Usually a gigahertz is fine. And uh, as of now, it's all based on CMOS. Uh, and we saw that even with a 128 nanometer CMOS, that's fast too. You can still get decent timing out of it. Uh, we, the other chip that we are trying, that we developed, uh, produced and now testing gets better performance because it's like 64 nanometer. So there is some advantage there. And another type of chip that we are trying to, to build is a silicon germanium. Uh, junction that should give you even more bandwidth uh, tuned to the to the right uh, range and should give you good timing with very low uh, power consumption. Simon, can I do some comment really? Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, put all data was just now Simon demonstrated from, for example, Brookhaven. Have been done this electronic connected through wire to another ball. So really there's no problem with really just saying it because no, no, yes, it's available, but connection on the board, and this is why it's, it's impossible to be used in normal experiments. Yeah. It's only test. So it should be done now with bone bonding, you know, right. put your data out on the top. So what does it mean? First of all, check okay, for how it was done. Second one, another kind of maybe electronic should be used. And second one, of course, it's thickness of the detector equipment. Three times maybe more than the we are sitting on on the center. So three dollars it's needs a lot of silicon and second one it needs uh, also temperature control so cooling. Right. So this program one after another, one after another. Mm -hmm. What was this huge RD in the front of this particular mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of right. and so also the my, integration of the electronics mm -hmm. is still needs absolutely this is yeah, electronic cool. design. Yeah. And for example, that's also just for different uh, size stick, one centimeter and three centimeters. You want to take even response. Yeah. My comment is maybe the reason for such one, maybe is like the quality of resistance protection. Is it the player? Yeah. If it's uniformity was broken, okay, you will get exactly what you're just mm -hmm. So once more another group of points for RNG activity. How to be sure that your resistance protection layer of uniform. And exactly what you would like from number of ribbons. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, so let's say you're planning an EIC. Yeah. But I mean, another so what can you count on in a timeline? Absolutely, uh, because it, it's yeah. unbelievable, unbelievable pressure for timing. Because two and a half years, you have to report the TDR in the front of timing. Yeah, but you don't have to have this final. There not final, but at least you can. What's it going to take to get yeah. it there when you? I don't know. It's, it's all it's it's huge pressure. Is it the cost is also less in front line, is less expensive? I don't know really. I know it's my talk. I think that's why I asked it in the morning. I think it's only like no. a lot to do so in terms of electronic design and yeah, you know, the yeah. shift integration and stuff. No. This TDR level, you have to demonstrate this prototype. Yes, you would like to transfer. Yeah. Yes, but it, even if you connected it, yeah, right now, it yeah. still even, nothing even close to the level. Still a lot of the damage. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You can easily make one in the device itself. The right. thing that's broken, I'm just wondering if it's actually about the projected cost per square, whatever, mm -hmm. meter or uh, centimeter. Yes, it, <laughs> exactly. Because it's 15.5 square meters detected in the AC. Cost more than 21 million. Wait, which detector? The EAC. EAC. Uh, Wait, how do you know what it costs? Uh, I don't know. It really was demonstrated during the presentation from the team. Using what? I cannot say. It's, it's my opinion only is that it's very, very optimistic. Because there is another very crucial uh, part of this measurement it's, uh, distributed loss from accelerator is super high level precision on a level better than 10 nanoseconds. It never was the system, nobody knows even. On the idea of how to do this one was never was done real. So it's another very costly part of all the process. So in any case, it's, it's very, very attractive. It's fantastic. It's just time in history, maybe science, you can do real point D detector. Never was done before. And of course, you have to pay something for this. It's, it's not cheap, it's not simple. And people are doing great job for r and But time scales unbelievable. I didn't tell you the <laughs> <laughs> No, also we discussed this Simon Paki, but it's another story. It's really, what is the reason for that detection in the ICU? Because it's a lot of Another comparing to other technologies. Yes, absolutely. Because really, yeah. what, 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 what is the reason for time of life for the IT detection? Because really, for borrow, you need particle dedication for all cousins and electrons, of course. And really, just to solve this problem, people decided to use so called GIRC. So, this is a piece of uh, a crystal. And that's like a killing for pendulum. But it's, any kind of sector has its own stage box. So it works only for particles started from 0.7 GeV. In this case, yes, after some 6, 7 GeV, you can select all pions, carriers, and protons. But what about smaller ones? Momentum. And unfortunately, for EIC physics, spectrum of charged particles in viral maximum. Has something like point four, and drops down from one, for example, GV five order magnitude. So to make in such particles, you need maybe a long time before it really can be in your detector. So you need a lot of identification, but identification for low moment. <coughs> that is why time of life is perfect from this point of view. But for very low moment particles, it was measured from but. There are another bit no to do the same job and significantly cheap. So that is why it's an industrial. This is another story about my business. This is out of my scope. Unfortunately, yes. But in any case, for the detector is something absolutely fantastic. So we can speak something for Alice G, maybe with the timing layer and so on. Yes, of course. One is three also think about the detector. But decision to be used as detector in Alice 2030. So this moment they yeah. decided. Right. The decision was the earlier, I think. What I read, I will know what no, it's earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they want to have data in 32. So I don't think <laughs> they can wait till <laughs> three yeah, or be 25. Yes. Yeah. Even idea, do you remember in, in RSA you use two layers? Yes. Yeah, the three will use for different layers. Yes, right. no, 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 it's two more. The same same time scale as the IC. Mm -hmm. So you can worry about two things. Yeah, that's <laughs> But you're right, it's principally kind of use this technology. I think RSA has this technology. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, but then you need the help of the industry because you can't produce 60, 70 square meters of this, right? So, yeah, that's that's the thing that's fine. so mass production also now, but like, okay, 
Yeah, yeah that's a good thing about it's very nice, very nice from RD point of view, but from detector is still a huge question mark. Yeah, that's what I really like about the pioneer experiment. I guess just go yeah. to VNL and say, okay, give me 50 two by two centimeter detector, and like, yeah, sure. That's one, and not even one production. Most of the huge difference pioneer and this space parameter on the data, most of And timing only reasonably fast, not to measure the some time of that or something like that. Only separate from one event to another on a scale of one megahertz. The difference. But to use both parameters, timing and space, it's only just the EIC. In this case, it's with the real. I would say for the detector, just yeah. but oh. I thought you said there was timing because you have to go to beta the spectrums. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but it's it's much more. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. not first on the line. Yeah, yeah, you need something like hundreds of picoseconds, yeah, you don't yeah. need like 20 picoseconds. That was the way signals of the uh, idea is the take on the point or hook on the point. It's uh, 100 something. Yeah, something because it's self supported effect. You yeah. don't need any mechanical stuff. Mm -hmm. If you have 50 micron silicon, it's like a piece of well, paper, yeah. so you need something to support it. Well, I think that's the point. Yeah, that's this is. This is why trying to convince you that in this kind of uh, activities you can really involve students from at all stages of their academic career, uh, first year students that can do some kind of measurement and analyze it in depth. So, and uh, then up to grad students doing more complicated stuff. And then I also involved a lot in. Uh, Lab tours for like high school students, outreach projects, etc. I built a small cloud chamber demo, as you see, I see with an aquarium, and it works pretty well. You can see particles with it, and it's always a good success. But behind our masks, we're all smiling because we want to make uh, cloud chambers for an But that also <laughs> kind of work. Behind the scenes, we have it work. Maybe doing the little ones, but it's not going to take up for this. But then it's also just like women to be involved in small scale experiments like Pioneer for anybody on student level, it's extremely good in my good, Very good knowledge how to do everything practically in target analysis around everything. So, this is it's also if somebody interesting, it's fantastic to see you come through all steps of experiments. In large That's experiment, yeah, in large experiment, of course, you never have that chance. You're only looking for some something. <laughs> yeah, but like this scale of banner, it's uh, 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 from my uh, from my point of view, I would say it's a big amount. I like that, <laughs> but not that. <laughs> I have a basic question about Pioneer. Mm -hmm. You showed this ratio of cross sections for the left time universality. Yeah. Such. I think LHCB came out with a similar measurement recently. It wasn't pion decays, but it is um, some DD made on the case. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they expected the ratio to be like one, order one, not, you know, 10 to the negative four. And is this just a consequence of the mass of the prion being much closer to the mass of the muon than, say, a beauty? Well, that's more kinematics. Yeah. Because then the. Yeah, that's why I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very 
You assume that the coupling of uh, the electron and neuron to W is the same. That's what I'm playing in the topic. And then you see this difference mm -hmm. because uh, of isospin properties. So the, the pion has spin one in this direction, and then you go out with uh, a lepton uh, and the neutrino, and they would like to be like this, but then the neutrino is much less, so it, it would like to be like this, and so it kind of reverse the spin of the lepton. And so since the neon is heavier, it's advantageous. Okay. Because you have this suppression factor given by the spin. Oh, Okay, so we're going to do again for the moment. Well, around if you have questions, I can ask these 